soon as you do that, I'll share it to Delano. Great, Lauren, thanks for being here. Oh, I'm super excited. I got a notification that was like 15 minutes. I was like, oh, that's right. I sent it. Okay, so we are going live. It's preparing to go live. Spinning, spinning, spinning. Um, Sherry, can you keep an eye on admitting people? I made you a co-host co as well as Ben, and uh, I don't know why, but it's asked people are needing to be admitted. Oh, I'm not seeing it. Usually, okay, hold on, it's still, it's still loading. Oh, Elaine. There's okay. Elaine. Okay. Okay, all right, do I click the... Okay, we you're already not. live, so you can go ahead. Let me uh, start the recording. Hi everyone, thanks for being here. I have a million screens open, so just give me a momentito and I will go back to the main screen. Here we are. And I am now starting the recording. Everybody get your happy face on. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Okay, we are now recording. Well, very good. Welcome everyone. <laughs> okay, now we're recording. <laughs> hey, so Lynn, do you want to talk just a wee bit about um, the name of this program? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, Kern County Library and the California State Library is very pleased to present uh, author Ben Gooderson today as part and parcel of our workforce efforts. Um, which were uh, are brought to you by a grant that we applied for and received. And uh, we have been doing work to develop a job seeker toolkit and support people in the Kern County area through our library branches and Beal uh, to help them with their job seeking efforts, as well as uh, appointments with people to design resumes or uh, job searches. Um, we're also making ourselves available on site on demand to help folks with tutoring and employment benefits. We have a new third party vendor, which is a brain fuse tool which offers live chat services for tutoring, uh, unemployment benefits, and also uh, job seeking. So we're really pleased to be offering some new tools uh, through our website, in addition to on site and on demand at our open, open library branches, to be able to help people um, with their job seeking efforts. And um, I'm very pleased to say that our uh, library was asked to present uh, what we have created at the California State Library uh, Conference. Um, so we were one of the top three libraries out of the 20 or so that had been awarded the grant money. Um, to present what we had done. So we're really proud of our efforts. And Ben is part and part that we're offering um, that's focused on different professions. And, you know, what does it mean to be a writer? What, what has his journey been like as a writer? Uh, how did he get published? Um, what's his writing process all about? And um, what is his relationship like with his publisher and more? So uh, Ben, thank you so much for being here. We're so pleased to have you. And uh, we will be fielding questions in the chat. So please make sure that you type your question in the chat and that it's addressed to everybody so we can see it, everyone in the meeting. And Sherry and I will, uh, will, will Put up our hands, Ben. So look for a hand, and that means that there's a question. So this is the hand. Uh, here we go. Can you see that? Okay. I do. Great. Sound, sounds good. Thank At you. a certain point, uh, when I share my screen, uh, the faces and the boxes may disappear, but just feel free to just speak. That's fine. We can keep it kind of informal. Uh, and I'll, I'll share a few slides and a few thoughts, uh, maybe about 10 or 15 minutes worth that might address some of the primary 
questions you know that uh, people may want to know about uh, regarding this topic and then of course we can move into any q a we like and i'd be happy to to speak to any point or any anything anyone's curious about but i'm happy to start in if if uh, that's good if anyone wants to say something more please do and then I'll, i can uh, begin whenever it's appropriate well, um, I'd like to ask um, if anyone attending here has any specific questions for Ben so he can cover it that you want to mention that maybe I didn't cover when I was doing my introduction. Um, Valentina, MJ, uh, anyone else, if you have any specific questions for Ben or anything that you're hoping that he can cover. Just type it into the chat and we'll just, we can just turn the time over to Ben. He's just a okay. well-known author, best known for his series, The Winter House series. So go ahead, Ben. Very good. Um, well, it's a real pleasure to be here. I had a chance to visit with the good folks down your way back in December. I think it was more primarily a, a younger audience, the audience for The Winter House series, which is, it's a middle grade series aimed at kids like ages eight to 12 or so. And so I think it was mostly that age group and maybe some parents or teachers then as well, if I sort of recall correctly. But uh, it's a real pleasure to visit with you guys again. And this session a little bit more focused um, on sort of um, what the writing process and publication process is, is really all about. And of course, all I can really speak to is my personal journey. And of course, some of the aspects of that will have general applicability uh, because it's somewhat of a generic path to move from being a person who sits in a room writing to someone who actually has a book published. But of course, many of the steps along the way will be unique to my own experience. And that's really you know, the, the totality of what I can speak to. Why don't I go ahead and put up my slides now? So if you give me just a moment, I will share my screen. And if folks can let me know uh, when they can see that, that would be great. I'm going to move it to presentation mode so it looks a little better. Uh, can you see my screen okay or what I'm showing there? Is that look? Yeah, you're good. Okay, good. I'm going to go through this stuff very quickly, uh, but just to sort of cue it up, you know, when I was a kid, these are some of the books that I really, really loved. I'm not going to name off all the titles. You can see them there in front of you, and I bet a lot of you are familiar with these, especially uh, a number of the ones on the, the top are very, remain very, very popular. And a number of those on the bottom are considered real long time classics. But these are books that I loved uh, growing up through elementary school. And then as I became older, and that really at a young age uh, fired my interest in children's literature, particularly what I came to understand to be middle grade literature, which again is ages roughly eight to 12, maybe grades like, you know, third through seventh or fourth through seventh, somewhere around in there. I really like that age group. And the books that I've written and published thus far have really been for that age group. Um, uh, over the last several years, and some of you librarians, if there's any teachers there, you may be familiar with some of these. These are more contemporary middle grade books that I've really loved a lot. And I'm showing you these because as I've gotten deeper into the middle grade world and become a middle grade author myself, I've become very acquainted with a lot of the other books that are out there. And these are some that I've really enjoyed over the last several years. And I, I realize this is not a presentation about other people's books and so on, but I just sort of want to give you a taste or a sense of, of sort of what my mindset has been as I have moved into the middle grade um, authoring realm. Of course, as I got older, you know, I moved on to more, I guess, mature or even sophisticated works. These are some books that I've loved as I moved, you know, into my teenage college years and beyond and, and that I've loved ever since, but I've retained a deep uh, love for an interest in uh, the middle grade world. So that gives you just a very, very quick sort of overview of my sort of reading taste, because I do think it's important to, to understand or to, to recognize where an author is coming from. I'm a reader. I love to read. I'm a bookworm, and I always have been. And the sort of stuff you're looking at now is what fills up my mind and my imagination. Now, a lot of people ask, well, have you always been a writer? And the simple answer is no, I have not. Um, when I first graduated from college, I became a school teacher. I, I got my degree from the University of Washington in English. And then I took a fifth year program to get my teaching certificate. I don't know what it's like now, but you only had to take one extra year to become a teacher back when I was doing this. Um, 
so I became a school teacher. And uh, right away, my very first job was I ended up teaching on the Navajo reservation or maybe more appropriately called the Navajo Nation in New Mexico. Um, and I taught there for seven years. That was my first real job. And that's a picture of me I took from one of the yearbooks I still have uh, in front of a club I ran called the Troubleshooters because we always did all kinds of good deeds or we tried to, I guess. And uh, that was the club. And there I am kneeling in front of them. great, great kids, great uh, students, great environment, particularly for me as a young teacher. I really felt uh, lucky and even more in hindsight that I was able to do that as a young man. Uh, but in the background, I started writing a little bit. I started writing for some a local newspaper and magazines, just kind of I just sort of enjoyed writing and just kind of fell into doing it. And really through a total fluke, I got a book contract to write a uh, travel nature guide to the Southwest uh, when I was in my like nearing my late twenties. And it was a small book company in Colorado. And I really enjoyed doing it. I, I, I it, it wasn't fiction, of course, it was nonfiction. It was all about the real world, I guess you could say. But I really enjoyed it. It was a lot of work, uh, but it was a lot of fun as well. And so I really started to get the writing bug then. And um, and then as the more I started to read, I thought, you know, it'd be fun to try to write fiction. Well, um, my wife and I and our kids, we moved to Colorado. I taught for another three years. And then we came back up to the Seattle area. And I actually got a job at Microsoft, which as probably everyone knows, a huge employer here in the Seattle Puget Sound area and worldwide. And um, I ended up working at Microsoft. I started off as an editor and then moved into other positions. But in the background, I still continued to write. And um, every night I would come home and I would try my best to write for an hour every evening. And I stuck to that pretty religiously, even when I worked at Microsoft, you know, a pretty demanding job. There's a picture of me giving a talk at Microsoft, that picture has got to be, I don't know, at least eight or nine years old by now. So I kept writing and writing and writing. Um, and, uh, you know, I wrote a couple novels, nothing really happened with them. I didn't really know what I was doing, but I enjoyed the process quite a bit. Well, one day um, when my youngest daughter, who now is 26, when she was about eight or nine, so we're talking, you know, 16, 17 years or so ago, we took a walk one day to a little park right by our house. That picture on the left, well, actually both pictures are at a little park that's just about two or three blocks from where I live. We live in a really beautiful area, if I may say so. And um, and so my daughter was young and she was a quite a bookworm. And she said, dad, let's go walk to the little lake by our house and take notebooks with us and we can draw pictures and write stories. And I said, that sounds like fun, let's do it. So we walked up that lake, it was a sunny spring day or early summer day or so. And I don't know why, but I just drew a picture kind of like of those mountains and I put a house in the middle of it. And I, I always like wintry stuff. So I, I just, the word winter house came to me. I said, that's a hotel called winter house. And on the back of the paper, I started writing a story and I wrote three paragraphs of a story about a girl and her name, the name Elizabeth Summers just came to me. And I kind of based her on my daughter because my daughter was a huge bookworm and this girl Elizabeth Summers in the Winterhouse books is quite a bookworm. And I just thought, you know, I'll write a little few paragraphs about this girl and she goes to the Winterhouse Hotel and she gets away from living with her mean aunt and uncle. I wrote three paragraphs. I read those three to my daughter while we sat by that lake. And she said, dad, that sounds good. Do you, now go ahead and write the whole book. And I thought to myself, well, you know, I've written a little bit and written that nature guide, but I don't know anything about really writing a book for kids. So I took the picture home and put it in my drawer and promptly forgot about it. And sometime later, maybe as much as a year later, she uh, came to me and said, how are things progressing with the Winter House book? And I said, there's no progress at all. I've done nothing with it. And she said, you should write the book. And in my memory, she kind of kept, urging me and my other kids uh, heard about it my wife did and they you know they kind of urged me to write the book they kind of teased me a little bit or they were sort of serious and I just started after a while I sort of started working on the book and I started writing it and you know then I would show it to people and I get feedback on it and so on and and I kept working on it I really 
enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun. Uh, by the way, that other picture there is that same lake in wintertime. You can see how much snow we get uh, here in the wintertime. So I kept working on that book. And then I reached a point after a few years, by then my daughter, Natalie, was already in high school, you know, so like many years had passed. And then I started thinking, well, I have no idea if this book is any good or not. But I wrote a book, it was like 200 pages long or so, 250 pages long. And so I didn't know what to do next. So I got online and I went to a website. It's not the website I'm showing you right now because I, I can't find that one. Maybe it doesn't even exist anymore, but it was something like the one I'm showing you right now. I just did a search on middle grade literary agents or book agents, and it turned up a website. And what I got was a whole list of men and women around the world who are agents. I knew I had to have an agent. I mean, I just sort of, you know, had heard that that is, is what you need. You can't just sort of show up somewhere and say, publish my book. You need an agent to help you out with it because I know nothing about the business uh, side of things. So I got on a website like this and I saw this huge list of agents and I read about what each of them was looking for. They usually have a little thing there. It says, you know, I like books that are about uh, animals or fantasy books or historical books or outer space or anything like that. And I just looked at each person's thing and they have a, an email contact thing there. And I wrote what's called a query letter. Any of you who are interested in being writers, you've probably heard of a query letter. It's a, you know, just a fairly brief thing where you just say, hey, I'm so-and-so, I've written a book that's about this. And if you'd like to read it or consider it or something to be my agent, I can send it to you. It's, it's that kind of thing. Uh, so I put together a query letter and I just started sending that query email to a bunch of agents on a list like I found on the thing I'm showing you. I pr promptly, or, or I shouldn't say promptly, I over about a year got rejected by over 40 of these individuals. And most of the rejections were very formulaic, like, you know, thank you, I have no interest. And that's fine, I understand it. A few of them said, you know, your book sounds pretty good, but I'm not quite interested, or it sounds good, but you should probably think about doing this or that, or, and it was nice to get real feedback from real people. By about number 45 on that list, a woman named Rena Rossner, and there's her picture right there, She's an agent with uh, the Deborah Harris Agency. And by the way, if any of you have ever read or heard of a book called Sapiens by Yuval Harari, it's been a huge worldwide bestseller. Uh, that is from the Deborah Harris Agency. They have other famous books as well, but that may be their most famous one. So when she contacted me, I'd heard of that book from her agency. So I knew that this was a reputable place. And she said, Ben, I really like this Winterhouse book you've written. Let's talk about it. We got on the phone. She shared some ideas with me. And it wasn't a whole lot of, of uh, input she had. And it all sounded pretty reasonable. So I rewrote the book in about two or three weeks because there wasn't a whole lot. Uh, she said, I basically like it the way it is. And after that, she said, well, I think it's a pretty good book. I'd like to sign you up to be one of my clients or whatever they call it. And I was like, wow, this sounds great. I've, I've always heard it's really hard to get an agent and it took me a long time. You know, I got rejected by a bunch, but now that I connected with you, I'm really happy that you want to be my agent. She said, sounds good. This was in November of 2016. Uh, no, no, November of 2015. In January of 2016, she started sending the book out. It, that's what's called putting it out on submission. I knew nothing about this process or that terminology or anything, but she started sending it out to a bunch of editors at book companies. And I quickly learned that there are five book companies that are known as the big five. And if you get a book contract at one of them, it's considered, you know, a really positive step. Well, she started hearing from some editors at some book companies, including some from the big five. And one of them was this lady here named Christy Ottaviano on the right hand side. Christy at that time was at Macmillan, which is one of these big five or top five book companies. So I was really excited that someone of that caliber was interested in Winterhouse. So my agent, Rena, made this connection with Christy. And Christy said, hey, Ben, she said it through Rena, of course. Ben, we here at Macmillan really like this Winterhouse book. In fact, we think it could be part of a series. Could you write three books rather than just the one? And I said, well, 
I hadn't conceived of a trilogy, but uh, that sounds like a lot of fun. I'm sure I could write three books. So by about mm, February or March of that year, just a couple months later, Macmillan, actually a subsidiary of Macmillan called Holt, um, through Christie, uh, they gave me a book contract to write three books. So I sort of sat back and looked at things and thought about things. And I realized, you know, I've been working at Microsoft for like 17 years and had wanted to do something else. And so a couple months after that, I quit my job at Microsoft to become a full-time writer. And I uh, finished the first Winter House book with input from Christy. And then we moved on to do the second and the third book. I, should, I say we, but really Christy, I had total autonomy, you know, to write the books the way I wanted to write them. And she would give me really good feedback because she was super experienced with writing good kids books or editing good kids books. And she helped me turn the three books into really fantastic uh, works. Um, and there's the covers of them. And, uh, maybe the librarians or maybe somebody on this call have seen the covers of those books before. Uh, Winter House, the first one came out in January 2018. The Secrets of Winter House, the sequel came out in December of 2018. And then the Winter House Mysteries, the concluding volume came out in January of 2020. So they all came out basically within a two year period, you know, one after the next. Uh, th they all came out in paperback after they'd come out in hardback and they've actually all been translated into 10 languages around the world. The whole thing has been a complete surprise to me. I, 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 you know, hoped one day to just publish one book. So the fact that it was a series, that it came out in hardback and paperback, that it's been translated in, uh, into 10 languages, and there's a possibility of a, 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 like a series through Netflix or Hulu. I don't know if that will, that will really happen, but it's well uh, underway now, and it may proceed, you know, even further. Uh, has just been an absolute miracle to me that it, this really came, came, came through. And uh, I, I, that was, you know, I quit my job over five years ago at Microsoft and, and I've been writing ever since and I just completely love it. Um, my next, uh, uh, by the way, my editor, Christy Ottaviano moved from Macmillan to Hachette, which is another one of the big five. She works for the Hachette subsidiary known as Little Brown, which probably a lot of you have heard of. It's been around for a long time. And my next book, it's called The Einsteins of Vista Point. Uh, will be coming out next year. It was going to be it was going to come out this year, but with Christie's move and the pandemic, things got delayed, which is fine. Little Brown has done a fantastic job already of uh, getting this ready to go. And what you see there is sort of the cover. It's it's kind of the wraparound, so it looks kind of backwards, I guess you could say. But the right hand side, of course, is the cover of the book, and the left hand side is the back of the um, advanced copy of the book. Not this is not exactly what it will look like when it comes out. And then a year after that, you know, in about a year and a half from now, I'll have another book out called The uh, Hidden Workshop of Javier Preston. And now I'm working on a series that will come out probably a year after that uh, about a huge department store in Southern Siberia. So I love writing these kids' books and I just keep, keep doing it. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I've shown you everything I think I wanna show you and I'd rather see you guys or anyone who's on the screen there who might want to uh, uh, so on. Uh, I, oops, let me get out of this here and get rid of this if I can. Sorry, everyone, trying to do too many things at once. But now I'm back to being able to see everyone there. And um, uh, I hope I answered a number of the questions that had that were sort of posed to me beforehand, uh, like how did you begin writing? What'd you write? All these things, what genre? But I'm happy to answer any of the questions. I think I addressed how I found a publisher and how the book got published and all that, but I'm happy to answer any of the other questions that people might have about my personal journey or sort of about the public publishing business in general. So Sh Sherry or Lynn or any of the others, uh, I'm happy to delve into that now. People can unmute if they like, or if you just want to feed me the questions from the chat, that's fine as well. And Sherry, you may be muted. I'm not hearing you. Yeah, so in there, somebody said, the query letter. <laughs> um, did you write the book before you sent the query letter? Can you pitch an idea and then write it? Um, uh, I, uh, I think it's uh, common 
for nonfiction to pitch an idea before you write, start writing the book. I don't think it's very common for fiction, for regular literature. I think most novelists write a book and then if they don't have an agent, they would uh, share, uh, you know, they would let the agent know they've written a book. I, I, I think it'd be pretty, un, uh, pretty unusual for someone to say, hey, you know, prospective agent, uh, I have an idea for a novel. Most agents will say, well, write the novel and get back to me. Um, but for nonfiction, I think it's pretty common for someone to say, hey, I have this really cool idea to write a book about, you know, exercise or, you know, the history of something. And, and an agent would say, oh, that sounds pretty cool. Why don't you write the first chapter and then let's talk about it. And then I can try to sell the idea. And if someone likes the idea, then maybe we can sell the book and then you would write it. So that is how, that's how I think it works. I think it's a different possibility for a nonfiction book versus uh, a novel or, or work of literature. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Um, I was hoping you could tell us about how you uh, incorporated the, the puzzles and the um, maybe a little bit more about the series and, and a little more detail about exactly what makes it unique. Um, Good question. Uh, you know, I've always loved puzzles and maybe with the kids back in December, I probably spent some time talking about things like anagrams and word ladders and the Vigineer cipher and all that, which we don't really have time or space to get into here. But I, I love um, puzzles, everything from, you know, hangman when I was a kid or playing Scrabble with my mom or crossword puzzles or acrostics and all that kind of stuff. And I just think it's a lot of fun. I think, especially for younger readers, maybe for everyone, you know, there's something really cool about a book. Uh, I think when there's a code or some hidden thing or something to figure out because it kind of exercises your mind and draws your interest in at a level beyond just the story. I mean, we all know, you know, stories can be, obviously uh, are incredibly captivating on their own. Otherwise we wouldn't read novels, but some people really like puzzles embedded in stories as well because it gives them a little something extra to kind of have fun with so i tried to incorporate that in all the books the kids in the in the books um solve a lot of puzzles on their own they do a lot of wordplay they kind of cleverly like to outdo each other you know by by sharing uh, word ladders and anagrams and so on and then also in the books themselves i tried to incorporate uh anagrams word ladders and what i call hidden words even in the chapter titles throughout the books, just as a little extra fun flourish for readers. So that's why I put that in there, Lynn. Uh, I, I like that kind of stuff. And I just sort of thought it might be fun for readers. And it also plays a role in some of the sleuthing in the books themselves. Um, do you mind explaining what an anagram is? Yeah, I will. An anagram is when you when you rearrange the letters of a word or words to form other words or a word. I'll give you an example. My last name is Guterson, G-U-T-E-R-S-O-N. And there is one word in the English language that I can't, if I rearrange the letters of my, of my last name to, I can turn into. It's the word sturgeon, which is the name of a fish. So uh, that's, I do this all the time. Like, Last night I was on a meeting with a guy. His name is E R I C Eric, and in my mind I'm rearranging his name into the word rice uh, because you can rearrange those letters into rice. And I often tell kids it started when I was young with the word stop because you can rearrange the word stop. Uh, you'd see it on a stop sign, right? So whenever I pull up to a stop sign, my mind would start to go crazy because you can rearrange stop into uh, post pots. Uh, tops, spot, and ops. Those are the five words you can rearrange uh, stop into. So anyway, that's what anagrams are. There's there's lots of them. You can rearrange Britney Spears into Presbyterians. So anyway, um, uh, <laughs> just think about it. But uh, that's what anagrams are. So I bet you're you're an amazing Scrabble player. Uh, you know, I don't really play it a lot, that often. My mother, who uh, has passed away, my dear mother, uh, she was a champion Scrabble player. So it was a lot of fun to play with her when when I was younger, I actually don't really play it that much, but I like, you know, uh, I just like playing around with this stuff in my head sometimes. Uh. 
So can you tell us a little bit about um, choosing an illustrator or what the publishing house does for you in that respect? Yeah, I have to say uh, this maybe didn't didn't come up and maybe wouldn't have come up. Uh, you know, sometimes people wonder about self-publishing and, and so on, uh, which has become more popular. Um, I, I, of course, didn't, didn't go that route um, uh, because I have to say when you work with a book company, the amount of promotional legwork that they do and marketing completely blows away anything one individual could ever do. I'm not putting down self-publishing. I just want to point out a very realistic aspect to publishing a book with a, the support of a book company behind you versus doing it on your own. Again, not putting any, anyone's path down, but there's a very obvious difference here. So the book company does so much for me. I, I can't even, or for any author, it's really hard to overstate it. Um, they get the books in the ha hands of all the right reviewers. They have contacts with librarians and teachers and all this kind of stuff. And, they, and of course, one great thing they did for me was they found an incredible illustrator named Chloe Bristol. Uh, to be frank, I had absolutely nothing to do with it. The book company makes that decision. Now, I think if you are like a super famous, successful writer, you could probably tell the book company who you want to have illustrate your book. But really, your book company has expertise in positioning or marketing your book, and they have a vision for what it's going to look like. And I have to concede they're right. I mean, I had an idea of what I thought the book should look like, but they have the experience on this. So they found a young woman named Chloe Bristol, who, you know, this was, you know, four plus years ago, and, and she's gone on now to do all kinds of incredible things. She's worked for Paramount Pictures. She's worked on the Mary Poppins movie and the SpongeBob movie, and she's done all tons of books and, and all sorts of things. Uh, but they found her and she just did an incredible job. And I, uh, I don't want this to sound funny. I had no say in it at all. I, I don't even think I could have vetoed it. You know, if they had sent me something and I'd hated it, maybe they would have listened to me. But of course, I loved it. Her work is absolutely incredible. And she did those three beautiful covers that I showed you. And she did about 25 black and white interior illustrations for each of the books. But the simple answer is, I don't think most writers really have much of a say in who gets chosen to illustrate their books. Now, the kids' books, you know, like illustrated books for little kids, obviously those are collaborations between an author and an illustrator, and they, that from the very start, they're making that decision. But a book that gets illustrated when it's for older kids like mine, an author just sort of accepts what the book company decides. And I've been extremely pleased with the illustrators they've chosen. Uh, do you like doing book tours or does sometimes you get very tired? Well, um, uh, yes to both of those. <laughs> uh, yes, I love them and yes, I get tired, but I really love visiting young readers. You know, as I mentioned at the outset, I was a teacher myself and I really enjoy uh, talking to students and meeting with students and teachers and librarians like yourself, as, as some of you on this call. And, and uh, I get really energized talking to young kids. It's, it's a total blast. I love meeting kids in person, or I've done a lot of Zoom over the last year, but um, I enjoy it. It is tiring. I like to put a lot of uh, energy into uh, talking to kids and want them to have fun when they, they hear what I'm talking about. Um, so I, I, I love doing it and, and try to do it as often as I can. Um, somebody wrote in and said, I'd love to hear about what goes into your end of book promotion. So what's expected of you? Well, um, the uh, promotional and marketing teams at the company, like with Little Brown. So like I met with them last week and they want to know all the stuff that I've done in the past, who all my contacts are that they can reach out to. Uh, and I, my job is to meet them halfway. So like they'll do things on social media and then I need to plug in. They, they'll create a banner for me for the next book. And I'll need to have that at the top of like, you know, Twitter or Facebook, you know, when the time is right. So my job is to compliment their efforts and they'll send me on a tour or two. Uh, it's, you know, to sign books, you know, and get them back to them. Uh, it's to sometimes... Uh, there may be like a podcast or some interview or something, and my job is to be available for that. Um, uh, it's, it's all those sorts of things. Uh, occasionally, 
there's been an outlet that would like some sort of brief essay or a paragraph or something about something particular, you know, and I'll write that for them. So uh, my job is, is, as I say, to, to help Little Brown uh, help me to give the book as uh, positive exposure as, as it can have. Look, I, I sit in a room a lot with the door closed, just dreaming up stories, which is, I love it. But, um, but at the end of the day, you hope that you will produce something that uh, readers, young and, and, and old alike, will enjoy and that they can connect to and will find some meaning or enjoyment or pleasure in their life. So, of course, you want people to read your book. So I want to help Little Brown uh, to, to get the book to as many people as possible. Um, how does the copyright work for your book content and our illustrations use? Um, but particularly the sharing of content or reading aloud. Um, for example, there's videos of your books being read aloud by chapter on YouTube. Do you want to comment on that? That's been something yeah, going uh, on. Uh, it is okay for people to read the first chapter or two, but, but obviously they're not supposed to have read the whole book and have it posted. That's, you know, the books, my books are standard, just like almost everyone else. It comes out in hardback, paperback, ebook, and audiobook, that's pretty standard nowadays, you know. And obviously, if someone's reading the whole thing online, that sort of could theoretically cannibalize or ruin the audio book option. So there is a, a wing of a legal department that each book company has. And if if they find something like that, they, you know, will have it shut down by YouTubers. It, it's illegal to do that, frankly, just like it'd be illegal for someone to go to a copy machine and copy every page and then post a PDF online of, you know, the Stephen King book, anyone's book. You know what I mean? I mean, that's that's illegal. It, it's uh, it's it's stealing. It's it's stealing from the author, basically, and the book company just it's equivalent to someone walking into Walmart and walking out with a TV. Walmart is selling it. And I, I'm in effect selling a story, you know, and, and people aren't allowed to sell it that, or, or to use it for their own ends. That's what, that's what copyright is all about. So I don't have to, I don't do anything for that. Uh, the book company handles all that. And if they discover something or if I find something, I can send it to them and, and then it's up to them. To, I don't have the power to shut something down on, YouTube or something like that. But that's why I guess lawyers make so much money. <laughs> well, we've seen a proliferation of that during COVID anyway. Um, yeah. So for like your engagements and stuff, um, does a publisher arrange them? Do you arrange them or is some a hybrid? It's, it's a hybrid. Um, the publisher, when they send me on tours or put me in front of audiences, they sort of arrange everything. And all I really have to do is just sort of show up. I don't mean that to sound funny, but they make it very simple for me. You know, like they take care of all the logistics and all the details. Um, uh, for other stuff, just like anyone, you know, I, I'm, I guess what you would call self-employed. I mean, you know, I, I go to lots of schools. I do things online, all this. And I guess you could say that's like my business. I, I, kind, of, I kind of run that and there's, you know, uh, honorariums involved and you know payments and so on stuff like that uh just like anyone else any other speaker who uh is 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 paid or compensated for for what they do but that's kind of on on me i'm also with an agency called booked uh they schedule authors to to, to visit schools last year of course was a total washout for authors you know aside from zoom which is great zoom gives you the opportunity to connect with people you might never have met before, you know, and really all around the world. It's, it's really incredible. But, you know, most schools, they like, they in, you can't beat in person, right? It's, it's like the difference between going to a concert and versus listening to an album. I mean, people love to see the favorite group live, you know? So it, I, I love going to schools and, and that's how I do. But it, Sherry, it's definitely a hybrid. A company arranges some things for me and I just do a lot on my own kind of on a, shoestring and all that so it's fun <laughs> yeah it's it's I mean it's pretty exciting Ben's you know written back to us and it's like oh boy um so you talked a little bit about you know going from a hardback to a paperback to an ebook to whatever um so the publisher decides that progression and that timeline yes uh typically 
for most books, uh, you know, of the major companies or bigger companies, a book will come out simultaneously in hardback and ebook options. And nowadays, almost always in audiobook. Audiobook used to be fairly rare. Any who are librarians, you know, probably realize this. Now it's sort of standard. Every book comes out in audiobook. In fact, some top authors uh, have done these audible deals where their book just comes out as an audiobook first. And then maybe the hardback trails, that would have been inconceivable just a few years ago. But anyway, so hardback, ebook, and audiobook almost always simultaneously. But then the, um, the uh, paperback will come out after that. Uh, mine came out a year afterwards. That's pretty typical for kids' books. And most publishers do it that way. They, they want to, as we all know, a hardback costs more than a paperback book. So it's more exciting and kind of feels, you know, really cool to have a hardback book. And, and, and that's how book companies want to do it. Also, I was really lucky for the Winterhouse books. They had these really nice wraparound covers with a kind of these cutouts you could see through. Yeah. to the uh, beautiful uh, cover underneath, which is really rare. I was totally surprised that they, and, and really happy that they did that. It, it makes it really beautiful. So uh, the paperback just can't really replicate that. It still looks beautiful, but it, it can't replicate the, the beautiful experience of the hardback book. But that's the progression, Sherry. That's pretty typical. Mine followed that as well. Yeah, the hardback book. I mean, it just adds to the whole ambiance of the mystery. Um, so you didn't really get a choice in the illustrator, which I so agree with you is just marvelous. Uh, what about the narrators on the audiobooks? Do you get any say so? No, same thing. <laughs> but 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 these are pros. I mean, they they choose people who are that's their career. You know, like Sophie Amos was the one who read the Winterhouse books, and she's fantastic because she's that's what she does. She knows how to use her voice and she knows how to read well and, and uh, enunciate and articulate and emphasize things. And she's just fantastic. I will say, I have no idea if this will fly. I've asked my book company if I can um, narrate the next book that comes out, my, my book, because authors do do this occasionally. You will, you know, you guys know, you will hear authors who read their own books and um, for better or worse, I, I like to think that I, I have a decent reading voice and can modulate my tone. And, and I kind of know in my head, I have an idea of who the characters are and what they would sound like and how they would speak, you know? And, and so like one part of me thinks like, well, I, maybe I could do that. So I've asked my book company if I could do the audio book uh, for my next book. Uh, and maybe they'll let me audition or something. I don't know the process. So we'll see what happens. Okay, so I want to hear your Elizabeth Summers voice. Oh gosh, <laughs> I, uh, I I would need the book here, but I, I no I'll grab pressure. it a second. If we have time. I'll do it for you. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's gonna be good. <laughs> <laughs> so that's really fun. Well, I don't see any more questions on Facebook or in our chat. Um, um, I have one random question, Ben. Okay. What is one of the most memorable or the most memorable fan mail from a kid that you got? Well, I've been really lucky through my website. I've, I have a contact form and I actually get email from kids all around the world uh, because, you know, the books have been translated, like I said, in all these different languages. So it's really fun to, to um, get uh, notes from people around the world. Um, I've gotten all sorts of really cute and really moving things, even from parents and and things where kids say they didn't they weren't really into reading or something, and then they read the book and they really liked it. I've had kids send me um, coded messages. They use the Visionaire cipher, which features prominently in the first book. That's really fun. They'll give me the code word, or kids will do word word ladders, you know, or anagrams and send me things. That's really fun. Um, uh, I, I will say, I once got a note from a, a kid, I, I think he was either in Germany or the Netherlands, and um, this is a little difficult to explain, but I have a concept actually for all the kids' books that I want to write. They will all add up to a world or a universe, and as I get deeper into my kids' books, I hope it will become apparent to readers what I'm trying to do. I have sort of an overarching notion that I hope will carry through all my books as I go forward. And it has to do with this thing of one of nine. I, and you might, some of you might recognize that sort of 
message occurred in the, particularly in in the third Winterhouse book, the librarian says we're one place out of nine around the world. And that's kind of what, where I'm headed. I had this young man write me a note. He said, I, when I read that, I thought, hmm, you should write books about the other nine places. And it was kind of spooky to me. So I, I wrote him back and said, that's exactly what I'm planning to do. So as I move through this, I'm going to create stories that take place in nine places around the world. And this young man really picked up on that. But the way he wrote his note was really moving to me. And that he had discerned that was pretty cool to me. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Can well, I, um, a uh, little I, plug for his, um, a little plug for Ben's website. If, if you want to see some of the things he's read, he did touch on it, but there's just a a plethora of things there, of things you can read, and some of the things that have made her the made him the writer that he is. Yeah, I put some book lists there, books I've loved, and and all sorts of things on there, and and uh, some stuff about codes and puzzles, and just all sorts of fun things. I, I mean, I did the website myself. I knew nothing about the website, so I kind of put it together, and hopefully, it doesn't crash or something one day. But it's for now, it's holding together. You think that you would get along with your characters? I think so. You know what's funny? Some people say, you know, I liked, I liked the setting of the Winterhouse books, but Elizabeth was a little cranky sometimes. And, <laughs> and I'm actually okay with that. Because I, you know, when you're a kid, you're not always all peaches and cream. Yeah. People have said, oh, she's kind of stubborn and she's headstrong. And I'm, I, I'm like, that's okay by me. I made her that way, you know, because... I didn't want her just to be sort of a perfect, always go along with everything and always nice and all that kind of stuff. So I think I would get along with Elizabeth about 90% of the time. Probably. That <laughs> it also yeah. stubborn too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you've got some fans who can't wait to um, to read the Southern Siberia department store novel. Uh, I, it's I um it's going to be the largest department store in the entire world, and it's fun. I like I love I love settings where a lot of stuff goes on, and the book I showed you, the Einstein one. There's a cool tower with a medallion, a coded message, and a medall medallion at the top of the tower, and then the book after that takes place in Savannah, Georgia, and huge art institute and there's all this stuff in the town square it's like savannah georgia kind of with the town squares there's all these cool things so i try to work puzzles and codes and mysterious stuff into everything i noticed i i actually have had access to the chat for a while and i just didn't peek at it so i do see a lot of nice messages there and and thanks for putting that in there i think maybe sherry you fed me uh most of those i'm glancing at it right now but thanks everyone for all those fun comments over there i see them now so well, huge thanks. I hope I answered everything that was given beforehand and through my presentation and during this presentation itself. It's a pleasure to talk to everyone and, and uh, meet you or re-meet some of you, I think. And um, uh, you can feel free through my website, uh, drop me a question. I'm on Twitter and Facebook. I'm not really that great on social media, to be honest with you, but, but I'm there, you know, you can sort of find me there. But uh, I'm happy to answer questions through, um, uh, through my website if you'd like to go that route so afterwards you think oh i should ask this just reach out and i'll uh, i i always write back sometimes it takes you know a few days but i always write back if you don't hear from me it means i i didn't get your message you can hit you can send it again <laughs> well thanks so much it's just been so much fun well me too <laughs> yeah thank you yeah well thanks thank you guys you, i look forward to staying in touch Dutch with you. Maybe I'll have a chance to get down to Bakersfield to Kern County Library one of these days. That would be a lot of fun. That'd be we great. Have, we, have, <laughs> I say, we have a beautiful art collection, a California fine art collection in our building that usually people that come don't expect it in the center of Bakersfield. So come come visit us one day, Ben. Okay, I'll have to tell Little Brown or or you guys can reach out and tell him send the guy down there. <laughs> and then we'll take you to DeWars. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, very and good. Have, and have some All right, you guys. Thank, thank you so much. All right, yeah. thank you. Okay, Bye. I'll talk to you later. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Bye, everybody. I can't wait that many years to read the Siberian. Siberian. <laughs> you, need, you need to take it off of live recording. Oh, oh, oh. You're still recording.
Okay, hold on. Okay. Momentito. There you go. I did it. <laughs> well, good. Now everybody knows I want to read that one. <laughs> Don't forget, take I, off the live, though. So I, I would have done it, but it wouldn't let me so come off. The state of California is very active, like Anthony mentioned, with respect to LAC. What are we watching? What are we listening to?